Good afternoon and welcome to the School of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University and to the Social Science Research Council's workshop called A Modern History of, Disinform of the Disinformation Age, Communication Technology, and Democracy in Transition. I'm Stephen Livingston, a professor in SMPA and in the Elliott School of International Affairs here at George Washington University and I'm s a senior fellow at the Kennedy School at Harvard University. The Social Science Research Council, which is supporting today's and tomorrow's events, is an independent international nonprofit that mobilizes necessary knowledge for the public good by supporting scholars worldwide, generating new research across disciplines, and linking researchers with policymakers and citizens. The part of the Social Science Research Council that we are most directly working with uh, in this workshop is called the Media and Democracy Program. It seeks to understand the evolving relationship between media, technology, and democratic life. Within this interdisciplinary and cross-sector scholarly community, the program incubates reflection and catalyzes research about fast-moving subjects, situating the present moment of technological and political change in broader historical and cultural contexts. By building bridges across disciplines and industry, the program works to consolidate an otherwise variegated field of scholars and practitioners. This afternoon's panel is a part of a two-day workshop that brings scholars together to discuss the origins and effects of our current post-fact political era, as it's sometimes referred to. While a great deal of attention has been focused on the role of Russian bots and trolls in American politics, especially since the 2016 election, relatively less attention has been paid to a consideration of the origins of disinformation that might have closer roots here in the United States. We have a remarkable panel drawn from the longer list of, of absolutely incredible participants in this workshop. Uh, and I will just take a brief moment to introduce our panel and then I will hand the program over to my colleague Frank Sesno. Jane Mayer in the red, uh, has been a staff writer for The New Yorker since 1995. She's the magazine's chief Washington correspondent, and she covers politics, culture, and national security. And she is the author of Dark Money, uh, which The New York Times named as one of the 10 best books of the year. Naomi Oreskes, immediately to my left, is professor of history of science at Harvard University, Professor Oreskes' research focuses on earth environmental sciences with a particular interest in understanding scientific consensus and dissent. Her 2010 book, Merchants of Doubt, with Eric Conway, her co-author, is a highly regarded account of, shall we say, interest group attacks on the integrity of science and scientific findings. Jochai Benkler is the, Berk is the Berkman Professor of Entrepreneurial Legal Studies at Harvard and a the faculty co-director of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. His books include The Wealth of Networks, How Social Production Transforms Markets and Freedom, that was two published in 2006. Uh, that particular book won many awards, among them the Don K. Price Award in, for the, in the American Political Science Association for the best book on science, technology, and politics. His most recent book uh, with two colleagues at Harvard is Network Propaganda. My students are going to know that book really well moving forward from now. Uh, Paul Starr, uh, my colleague uh, here, is the Stewart Professor of Communications and Public Affairs and Professor of Sociology with a joint appointment in the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. He has written widely about healthcare institutions. In our current context, Professor Starr's 2004 book, The Creation of Media, Political Origins of Modern Communications, is of particular relevance and interest and importance. And my colleague Frank Sesno will be moderating today. Uh, he is, has been the director of the School of Media and Public Affairs for 10 years now. Before that, before coming to academia, he, was highly success he had a highly successful career in radio and in television news, including a long career at CNN. Uh, that included a stint as the White House correspondent, I believe at the same time that Jane Mayer was the White House correspondent. Uh, and also he was the bureau chief uh, here for CNN in Washington, D.C. And with that, I turn the floor over to Frank Sesno. Thank you very much. 
And with that, I thank Professor Stephen Livingston, a great colleague and friend and a real um, uh, person of commitment to, to this topic. I want to welcome and thank the Social Science Research Council for coming to uh, Washington and GW in this amazing panel. <coughs> what we'd like to talk about today are three general themes uh, as we kind of wrap our brains around this post-fact world that we're in, if it's a post-fact world. Certainly it's a world in which the facts are fighting for themselves. Um, theme one, to understand that this is more than merely about tweets and Facebook posts. This is more about Russian troll than, than Russian trolls and bots. This is in fact a full ecosystem. Secondly, um, what is the role, and to try to understand the role, of domestic actors? Um, who's playing what role? Um, the radical right, anti-democracy groups, individuals, corporations. And then finally, and not least of all, um, this notion of outside influence. Who, what, from where, and why. We won't get to all of these things in their entirety today, or we would write several more books before we were done, uh, but we'll try. Um, so I'd like to start, uh, Yochai, uh, with you, if I may. Your book, Network Propaganda, which I found riveting because of <laughs> my work in not network propaganda, but in a network, <laughs> um, um, says the following. You call it a crisis, what we are experiencing, and you say it is more institutional, more institutional than technological, more focused on U.S. media ecosystem dynamics than on Russia, and more driven by asymmetric political polarization than by commercial <coughs> advertising systems. Can you unpack that for us and uh, give us a sense of what that ecosystem is, is actually like? In 472 pages. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll uh, give you 30 <laughs> seconds. No, 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 please. Um, let's take each of the three. Um, the book, uh, uh, we use a lot of data, the millions of stories and how they're tweeted and Facebook shares to get at the answers. Um, the core claim is that when we look at the shape of communications in the United States, whether we measure it by how stories are tweeted, whether we measure it on the supply side by how media producers link to each other and give credit, whether we do it by text and the similarity of text or by Facebook sharing, what we see is a highly asymmetric uh, media ecosystem. We see a very insular right wing that links to itself. Uh, the, producers <coughs> the producers pay attention to each other and give authority to each other. The consumers only look at what's inside. And then the rest of the media ecosystem is uh, a single ecosystem where you can't really talk about it as post-truth. Instead, you need to see everything from the Wall Street Journal and Forbes, all the way to Mother Jones and Daily Kos and the Huffington Post, all forming a single media ecosystem anchored in professional journalism with a variety of more or less uh, partisan framings around it. What do you mean single media ecosystem? What does that actually mean? It means that when you look at what sources are most cited by all of these, irrespective of how far left or, or center right they are, that's traditional professional media, it's the New York Times, it's the Washington Post, it's CNN, and there's a normal distribution of attention. The farther away you get from that <coughs> The farther away you get from that mainstream, the less attention you get. Once you look at the right, it's exactly the opposite. The more exclusively right-wing your content is, the more attention you get. In fact, when we look at the structure of the right-wing media ecosystem, during the election, the most important site online was Breitbart because it had a duet with Trump. Fox News in 2017 re-emerges as the most important part but only by becoming more right-wing. It actually loses links and attention from producers in the center right and the center as it's increasing in authority in the right. So it is faced with a choice, either go full Trump or lose attention, and it goes full Trump, and we see that in the data. 
So that's the asymmetric polarization. And critically, it's only in this insular media ecosystem that only is a strong word, overwhelmingly in quantitative terms, most of the falsehood, confusion, um, um, uh, fake news in the sense of clickbait uh, that's trying to be commercial occupies this system much more so than on the left. And on the left, when it emerges, what we see is a story emerges, then it's fact-checked from inside the system, and then it dies. So the dynamics are very different, and the insularity of the right-wing media ecosystem is what makes it susceptible both to Facebook clickbait fabricators and to Russian propagandists, and most importantly to domestic propagandist outlet, Fox, Breitbart, and so forth. So it's important for people to realize, those who are not familiar with your work, but and who are also trying to figure out this ecosystem, that the Russians, which are the focus of so much, who are the focus of so much attention, are hardly going first in this ecosystem. They are piling on. That's, exact, that's exactly what we see. Essentially, we see them in our data. We can identify them using a variety of outside sources of, of, of what are known Russian bots, for example, or suspected Russian accounts. But it's very rare that we see a story originating on the right. And when we look at the major stories that have occupied the last few years, um, I'll give you a small example. Uh, in one of the Mueller indictments, there's a story of Russian Facebook face talking about voter fraud. When we actually dig into every mention online of voter fraud around those weeks, mm -hmm. what we see is that they show up at the peak after it's been going up following Trump talking as a candidate about voter fraud, the right wing uh, media talking about it, then <coughs> traditional media reporting on Trump, and four days later, this Russian event jumps on. It's implausible to imagine that the Russians are driving, as opposed to that they're existing in the background and poking a little bit here and there. Um, and, and we haven't seen evidence of that quality to suggest that here's a story that they started and it became really important, or it's here's how they were particularly important in parts of the country that made a difference to the election. That's interesting. I want to stay with your work, Yochai, because it's so groundbreaking and thorough, and then broaden the conversation. You cite <coughs> in, in, in the book your um, <coughs> suspects in what you call the present state of information disorder, and there are many. Fake news entrepreneurs, political clickbait fabricators, Russian hackers, bots, sock puppets, Facebook, as you said, the, the, uh, the newsfeed algorithm and online echo chambers, as you call them, Cambridge Analytica, white supremacists, alt-right trolls, right-wing media ecosystem, the mainstream media, which has a, a supporting role in all of this. Donald Trump himself, as you point out, often leads, leads this. Um, so it's quite a cast of characters. You say that the 2016 presidential election and the Leave campaign in, in Britain which resulted in the Brexit vote, uh, both, you say, seem to mark an epistemic crisis in contemporary democratic societies as 2016 was drawing to a close. Many in the United States and the European Union as a result of all of this, you say, saw these events as signals that democracy itself was in crisis, buckling under the pressure of technological processes that had overwhelmed our collective capacity to tell truth from falsehood and reason from its absence. That's, you said, as of 2016. Okay. As 2018 draws to a close, let's fast forward that situation. But Michael Cohen's going to jail. The special counsel is very much employed. Democrats are about to take over the House. Theresa May survived her vote. So what do you make of this crisis, <coughs> as you call it? What's become of it? So that's... A very good question. I want to clarify that the data that I have that's very clear ends in early 2018. To the extent that what I'm saying is based in data, it's much more limited for 2018 itself. Um, that said, understanding the core of Trump's support is impossible without understanding the shape and insularity of the right-wing media ecosystem in the United States because 
for those people who pay attention outside of that system, uh, the incompetence, the likely criminality uh, is overwhelming. And yet when you're inside, <coughs> there's always a reason to divert, not to agree, an excuse, and a daily flow of either diversion of attention toward other uh, uh, subjects, whataboutism, or uh, something of that form. So we, when we try to understand how, when we, who don't occupy that space, try to understand the persistent support, I think it's important to understand that nothing has changed in terms of the internal dynamics of the disinformation ecosystem. We document in great detail how Fox News responds to every uh, negative uh, uh, development in the Trump-Russia investigation by throwing out something new. One day it's the Seth Rich conspiracy, another day it's Uranium One, they embrace the deep state and completely reframe the meaning of the deep state in response to that. Then in the run-up to this election we see the caravan. So that's one major step is we are seeing a steady base of support because they continue to listen to that. So, so the crisis continues? <coughs> the crisis continues, absolutely. I, I guess what I see it as is a contest that you feel is building to more and more of a kind of a showdown. So I think part of the reason many of us feel when you wake up in the morning and you look at the papers, you're kind of on the edge of your seat, like, is this the day that something you know is really going to come to a head? Because you see that there are these two ecosystems, and they're kind of in competition. There's different methodology in each. The press in one is the old media, the people like myself at the New Yorker, who, and that, as you say, the spectrum goes from you know Mother Jones to Forbes and Wall Street Journal, which I also used to work for, where we have a methodology where we check facts, we call people with multiple points of view, we include different points of view in the stories. We try to figure out from an old kind of enlightenment idea what's true and put it, it's almost a scientific process. And then you have this other process on the other side that's really about supporting an ideology or an office holder, in this case Trump, and, and, and recreating the, you know, rearranging the facts to make them work for him and, and for themselves. And, and what you're, you, you mentioned all these processes that are playing out. You've got Mueller, and he seems to be getting closer and closer. And you can hear the theme song of, from Jaws, you know, <laughs> moving, <laughs> boom, 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 boom. And what's going to happen on the day when he drops a report? What we've already seen is has, Trump has already said that um, my people wouldn't allow anything bad to happen. Basically, they will rise up. I could never be impeached. Um, we know in the old days there was a process you could kind of count on on the rule of law and, 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 and the press was part of that old process. I think this is the contest. We're waiting to see. Will, will gravity reassert itself and will people like Mueller, if there is something there, will the facts that as, as a prosecutor brings them, will those facts matter or not? It's going to be a real showdown. So I don't know that we're, I think we'll know how bad the crisis is when we see this. So just if I can follow on, sure. I, I think what, what Jane is alluding to here is that we're faced not only with a crisis in the norms of journalism, but a crisis in constitutional norms, uncertainty as to whether the processes of government that we have counted on in the past, the rule of law, whether that will hold under these circumstances. And I think that's indicative of the fact that these changes in the media are so closely related to the political conflicts in the country that have led to uh, these kinds of sharp opposition, the intense polarization, the intense negative uh, uh, partisanship. So it's not just that people prefer their own party, they increasingly hate the other side. I mean, this is the, this is the context now for what we're seeing in the media. Jane, uh, for just a quick quest uh, question about this cast of characters in this allegedly post-fact world in which we live. You have taken a hard look at corporations and wealthy families and individuals and the role mm -hmm. they play. What, and uh, what significance do they add to this, to this ecosystem? 
Well, on the right, I think you're talking about in particular, um, if you go back and you look back four decades, basically, right. this is a kind of a historic um, you know, thumbnail sketch of what happened was you had a number of very wealthy uh, corporate uh, families on the far right who didn't like what was happening in the country politically. Um, and this would have been sort of the, the starting really going back to at least the 1970s. You could argue it goes way back before that, but just take it to back to the 1970s. They, um, the, the one family that I write about, particularly Charles and David Koch, and Koch brothers as they're called, um, pretty much decided by 1980, after they took a stab at running for national office and didn't win because their ideas were considered so fringe that they were far to the right of Ronald Reagan, um, um, that they, they decided that the regular democratic process wasn't going to get their ideas into power, and they needed to figure out another way to move their ideology uh, towards taking over the country, getting more, getting more power. And so they built a, a, a system that's basically uh, uh, an idea, an ideological factory. And, and ideological they did it on factory. purpose. Yes, they, they, they were not happy with the press. They were not happy with the establishment press, that is. They were not happy with the point of view in, the, in academia. They were not happy with the courts. They were not happy with what was being said in the pulpits. They weren't happy with the social movements at the time, which had to do with an the anti-war movement was big, the consumer movement was big. People were pushing for regulations on businesses like theirs. So they tried to, they, th it, they decided that you can't really change politics unless you can change the ideology in the country. And the way to change the ideology in the country is to subsidize there were uh, a whole factory that would put out um, papers that supported their point of view, pay for academic chairs that supported their point of view, um, create social movements so they'd have people out in the streets that were militating for, for their kind of worldview, which was this sort of neoliberal um, laissez-faire economics, um, low tax, small government, um, saying that the government was the enemy. They, they basically subsidized, um, they are the foremost subsidizers of, of libertarianism so in America. Did they, did they subsidize this ecosystem then? Well, it's, 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 it's not quite so easy. It's, it's what they did was they showed that um, ideology can be subsidized, that you can weaponize ideology and you can, you can you can pay for think tanks, and the think tanks will put out <coughs> your ideas, and you can fight the mainstream media. Okay, they did what, and eventually, what we're looking at now is a kind of a—it's um, morphed into this. So, Naomi, give us the historical line here. I mean, you've looked at at all of this and the impact on science and how science <coughs> has been under siege, mm -hmm. and and how this plays. Thanks. Yes. Well, it's diff one of the things that's difficult about this issue is that we all feel that the present moment is different and worse than things that have happened in the past. And yet, if we look at it historically, we see a pretty long historical story that I used to say began with the tobacco industry, but now I actually know it goes back even further. But if we at least start with the tobacco industry, we know that in the 1950s, the tobacco industry was confronted with a very strong body of scientific evidence that demonstrated beyond any reasonable doubt that their product killed people when used as intended. And the industry had a set of choices in front of it. They could have chosen to switch to producing other products. They could have chosen to diversify. But what they chose instead was to fight the facts. And they began to work with public relations companies, with advertising agencies, and then to create front organizations, uh, astroturf organizations that appeared to be independent but really weren't, to fight the facts and to promote a set of arguments, some of which were counterfactual. We don't really know if tobacco is harmful. But a second set was ideological, to say that yeah. any attempt to regulate the industry will be an assault on personal freedom and take us on the slippery slope to socialism. And it's that piece that I think links to Jane's story, and to some extent to Yahir as well, that they began to realize that actually supporting the ideological argument was a very effective strategy because it would it would appear to be principled. Because if a tobacco industry executive said, oh, don't worry, our product's fine, most of us would realize that those executives were not objective and independent, that they had a vested financial interest. But if they said, well, we believe in freedom, 
we believe in liberty. We think you should be able to decide for yourself whether you want to vote. And you don't want to live in a nanny state where the government is going to tell you how to live your life. That argument would not necessarily seem self-interested. And it would resonate with the think tanks, such as the American Enterprise Institute or the Cato Institute. And therefore, they could create an alliance with these other organizations. And so I see the tobacco industry as a key part of the origins of this story, which then the Koch brothers and other groups then reinforce in a variety of ways. So Paul, it's a, it's a, it's a significant intellectual undertaking, but also an important element of just understanding the moment to see whether there is a clear narrative through this time that then brings us to this moment of crisis yeah. and, and, and peril for evidence-based, fact-based thinking. Yeah, so there are a number of currents that I think come together. And I, I think, you know, the, certainly industry was pushing these ideas and the Koch brothers and so forth. You do have to ask yourself, uh, so why did, why was there the response to it? And I, I think you, you, you have to take into account the long backlash that we have had against the enormous changes that have taken place in race, in gender, uh, in particular. Uh, this is a backlash that is concentrated, let us be clear, among white men. It is especially strong among older people. It is in response to an enormous transformation in social relations that has been going on. And I think the has been, in effect, an alliance of convenience uh, between these uh, uh, economic interests and these concerns about identity uh, and status. And in a period when, of course, many working class people have suffered economically from stagnant incomes and so forth, and uh, are consequently responsive to a lot of these uh, denunciations of a government that, from their point of view, isn't doing enough for them. So I think, you know, you, there's, a, there's, there's, there's a whole context. But I want to. Um, uh, talk about another element that's, I think, in a way complementary to what Yochai talks about with the emergence of this right-wing uh, uh, media ecosystem uh, uh, that really began even before the internet. It began with Rush Limbaugh, it began with Fox News in the 90s, and the internet has helped amplify this development. This is, this is a crucial aspect uh, if we're concerned with the, with the spread of di disinformation. But then on the other side, in this same period, there has been a tremendous weakening of what are often derisively refer referred to as the mainstream media. There yeah, we don't sit around talking about the CBS Evening News right. ever. Yeah. I mean, and they still have millions of viewers, yeah. but that conversation does not involve much of the mainstream media anymore. Yeah, and there, I mean, there's been a tremendous contraction of journalism, just sheer the number of reporters. This is especially, and especially at the local level. Especially at the local level. So that people who used to get their local paper and used to have a window on the world that was to some extent um, uh, uh, moderated by the local editors and by the Associated Press and so forth. And those gatekeepers who are often denounced, those terrible media gatekeepers, but they did keep out some of the uh, uh, lies and distortions uh, that now are transmitted readily online. So we had um, uh, the, the, tr the tremendous weakening. There was another factor here, too. The, the, uh, the broadcast networks, uh, the big metropolitan newspapers, used to be phenomenally profitable. And they cross-subsidized. They, they used their profits. Uh, from the classifieds, for example, in the local papers, uh, or from the advertising uh, income that streamed in to, to the, the networks. They used a lot of that to do reporting, which was not profitable in and of itself. But they thought the editors believed this was, this was what the public needed to, be he to hear. And really that pattern, that cross-subsidy for um, public regarding news, that, that has can uh, I just me, draw on one, one thing sure. that Naomi was saying, which is because you were asking, well, so how does this relate to right now? I mean, when you talk about um, how the tobacco companies decided to fight the facts, it's not a, a far leap 
to uh, Kellyanne Conway saying, what we have here is alternative facts. Um, when, she sh when they showed pictures of the, uh, the, the Trump inaugural with smaller crowds and insisted that they were larger crowds than those for Obama, she said, well, we have alternative facts. What you're talking about in both cases is the idea that, um, that, that what the media showed you is, a, is a, and what the experts, what the gatekeepers were telling you isn't reliable and they can provide an alternative version of what the truth is. And, that, and that's what we're dealing with in the Trump administration and quite openly in, in many cases. And, and Yochai, as you point out, it, this is hardly just the Trump administration and just the United States of America. This experience is being replicated in places around the world. What does your research and these millions of stories that you looked at tell us about whether there's a universality of experience depending on where one is. I mean, we can look to Hungary, we can look to Poland, we can look to Turkey, we can look to many other countries where similar, similar things are happening, though at different decibel levels, uh, perhaps. So, um, the first intuition when you see the rise of far-right parties across different countries is to assume that they have a common cause. When your own sense is that it's about technology, then you say, well, Facebook is over there and WhatsApp is over there. The first, in, in that regard, the first caution coming out of our work is that even if there is a shared common denominator or common driver, it probably isn't technology. So in the US, if we, in fact, Facebook and Twitter were the primary driver, you should expect populations that are at the same technological frontier to adopt similar patterns. But in fact, that's not what we see, because the left doesn't adopts the technology as much, but not, uh, uh, but not the replication of the falsehood. Similarly, uh, uh, when you actually look at surveys and individual observations, you see that most of the crazy stuff is, is uh, propagated by actually over 65-year-old uh, Republicans and there's a small number a small number of people propagating a huge amount which gives the impression that there's so much sharing but it's actually by a small the over thing. 65 Democrats are not doing this nowhere near it's not not in a statistically significant sense no it's not it's just it's really focused on older Republicans who are replicate again that's not our work that is current work that's been done more recently by others uh, looking at specific individuals uh, and and their sharing patterns so translating that into Europe um, I think in trying to understand what the common denominator is, I would start by looking at the collapse of the neoliberal project in the recession and austerity after it, the widespread sense of insecurity that then provides uh, the, the, the angst that can be leveraged by the right wing. But I actually think we need to go and study. It may well be you know, Brazil's media ecosystem is such that traditional media are really important online. Television advertising is really regulated in favor of incumbents. And by all accounts, though we haven't measured it yet, Bolsonaro really did rely on WhatsApp and YouTube and Instagram. Uh, and that was really driving there. We need to document that and find that out. Naomi, recession and insecurity were not necessarily the words that went hand in hand during the tobacco confrontation. Yeah. That was not a time of social media. Right. So it suggests that social media has certainly been an amplifier and an accelerator. Yes. But um, was was not a necessary ingredient or the, 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 the fundamental ingredient to this sort of thing. Or it, am I it, wrong about that? I don't know. I feel like this is a really important question that we need to dig in more because, you know, you've made a compelling argument that it's not. But on the other hand, so if I look at the various things that I've studied, so in our book, Merchants of Doubt, we had a set of issues where in each case we had seen a disinformation campaign that always followed essentially the same playbook of challenging the scientific evidence, offering alternative facts, which expression actually I used in a lecture about 10 years ago when Kellyanne Conway was being credited with inventing this phrase. <laughs> I got an email from some fan who said, no, actually you did. Really? Would, you, would you like that? Would you like to I'm go not on not first? <laughs> it, was it was a negative <laughs> pejorative context. I said the tobacco industry was in effect offering a set of alternative facts. Um, so tobacco, acid rain, the ozone hole, climate change, the harms of DDT. But 
what we could say looking back on those episodes is that while there was a disinformation campaign and while it clearly did delay social change to some extent in each of these issues, not terribly long, right? I mean, my view is that we could have had tobacco control more quickly if we hadn't had the opposition of the industry, but we did get tobacco control. We did regulate acid rain. And in fact, acid rain's a really instructive one because we regulated it under the administration of George H.W. Bush, who signed Clean Air Act amendments. So even though there was pushback from industry, we had a Republican president who accepted the scientific evidence. He looked for a market-based solution. He said, I don't want a command and control solution. I want a solution that gives industry flexibility Fair enough. Democrats accepted that argument. They said, okay, they didn't like it at first, but they saw the logic of it. They went along. We regulated acid rain. We basically solved that problem, more or less. Um, and the same with the ozone hole, even more so. I mean, the ozone layer is now recovering. So in these other cases, yep. we see a story in which, despite pushback, ultimately facts did prevail, and we did get sensible public policy based on good information. And now, though, that's not happening, and of course, for me, the cri for me, the crisis of this is the crisis of climate change, because we are heading, I mean, we are on the road to a train wreck, and that's something that I think uh, even many people who take the issue seriously don't fully appreciate, but we know that the disinformation around climate change has been radically effective, again, mostly among white men over 65, definitely asymmetrical, mostly Republicans, not Democrats. But this is, a, from my perspective, you know, a crisis of existential proportions. And here, um, you know, we, President George H.W. Bush signed the United Nations Framework Convention in 1992. So, I mean, this is a delay of monumental proportions. And if we were fixing it now, we might say, okay, it was a delay, it was bad, but we're doing it. But, you know, if anything, things seem to be worse now than they were a few years and ago. And it brings all, uh, climate change brings all of these issues, all of what we've been saying together, because right. it, it's, it's flourishing in your alternative ecosystem, and it's playing to the resentments of um, people in backlash who were losing their jobs in the old fossil fuel mm -hmm. industry and the coal industry and things like that, and it's funded by the people who I was writing about who happened to be in the fossil fuel industry and their whole profit plan depends on oil. And there even seems to be some indication that pushed by the United States, there are places now where this narrative is taking hold in other yes. countries, right. which is a um, very significant and, and relatively new oh, And Just one more piece oh. about the economics, though, because when you talk about the job loss in the coal industry, I mean, that is really old news. That happened 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it, at, and at this point, it's a small right. number yeah. of people. Let me, let, let me ask you, um, and but it's symbolically important well, because it feels to many people like a story about what's happened to the, the hollowing out of an industrial America. Let me ask you to take us into what you think can be the media response to some of this, certainly journalism, you're in the middle of this right now, and the public response because that's also very interesting how citizens and news consumers have become habituated to this new ecosystem, Yochai, that you, that you write about. When I was bureau chief at, at CNN, there was a, a, a wonderful moment in history <coughs> when Bill Clinton was president. We had this thing called the Lewinsky thing. Um, and we ins actually instituted a policy at CNN that if another news organization had a story that they reported, we would not put that story on the air, even if it was a very well-known news or trusted news organization, until and unless we could confirm it ourselves. Mm. What a quaint notion. <laughs> it's still true with the New York Times. Okay, mm. okay. But it's not true in the world of cable news. It's not true in the world of many online news organizations that feel that they have to respond in real time. So the question is, you talked about gatekeepers, right? Are, is there anything left of gatekeepers? Not much. Armed with what we've been experiencing and what you've studied, can we, in any fashion, either train news consumers or train news providers to, to have some sense of gatekeeping, or is that time just gone? Well, I, I think Yochai's work shouldn't be taken only in a negative fashion. 
he does show there is this right-wing media ecosystem where falsehoods spread. But the other part of his story is that there is this other media ecosystem stretching from the center right to the left where there still is um, uh, uh, some control and where the journalistic norms still are upheld. And that makes a very big difference. I don't think we should just give up and say, oh, you know, it's, it's hopeless. Uh, it's still absolutely the job of uh, 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 the TV and radio and newspapers and so forth to do their, uh, to do as much checking as they can and to try to arrest the spread of falsehood. Uh, I, I don't see I don't see any reason for fatalism about now the one pr the one question I have I, I'm going to ask a question of Yochai too I mean you've got this insular um, uh, ecosystem and people who are just uh, 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 looking at those media how big is that how mm -hmm. how many people because ultimately you know we st we still do have a, a democracy all right and and ultimately the question is frankly can they be out outvoted. So, if I may, um, um, uh, absolutely, we are looking at a large minority, but a distinct minority. Um, uh, we don't have direct measures. Um, if I back out of the responses in a variety of surveys of Trump voters, of Republicans, of, or in a uh, over the last few years, we're probably talking about anywhere from 20% of the voting population to about a third of the voting population that's in this cult-like insulated media ecosystem. And the m remainder is made up of people who sometimes see, watch this, and very much yeah. do watch CBS and NBC and ABC and CNN. And so actually that is, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to embrace the optimistic version, and in fact, in the book, the single most likely effective actor is traditional professional journalism. Mm -hmm. Because one of the findings is, yes, it continues to have an enormous influence on other media producers, including online media producers. And uh, it continues to have the most aggregate attention on Facebook and, and Twitter, even by those measures. So. Uh, it's actually, it's a good story for traditional media that there's a little bit more breathing room. Uh, I absolutely, we've written very specifically that the critical thing is to double down on fact checking, to be, but to back away from the idea of balance, because once you understand that you're in an asymmetric propaganda system, when you're trying to present both sides, just as 15 years ago we we learned yeah, thank you. <laughs> that uh, we, we I'm learned waiting to jump in just here, 15 right? years ago, we yes. learned that saying, oh, there's a scientific consensus and there are these other scientists mm -hmm. and what readers take is, oh, there's no Debate. consensus. Right. Um, that's the lesson we need to learn today. Um, when we study what the top 50 mainstream media organizations wrote about in the election, with Clinton, it was email, 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 foundation, email. With Trump, it was immigration, immigration, jobs, university, immigration, immigration. So it's really critically important to insist on that, um, uh, uh, on fact checking, insist on mutual checking, making the work as publicly available as possible in terms of linking to sources, being very clear about the uh, sources, being absolutely uh, uh, on the spot to turn around and acknowledge error where error exists. Um, if there are practices like having a big board with how many tweets or how many Facebook shares your story has, those probably need to go. Those are probably really bad incentives. Can, can I jump in here? I, I agree. I think that's a really important point. It's a little bit hard for me to be entirely sanguine about the mainstream media for exactly this reason, because two things. First of all, we know, and we've documented it, that for decades, the mainstream media's notion of objectivity and balance led them to give greatly disproportionate attention to you know, the d climate deniers or to present representatives of the tobacco industry or the Cato Institute as if they were appropriate uh, counterweights to the scientific community, and frankly, that still goes on, even with the latest 
Well, they're under pressure by these groups, as you say, who are trying to undermine scientific consensus and made to feel that they are not being fair, fair if they don't put on these opposing voices. Correct. And journalists have continuing to do that even today. And even I've spoken to journalists, and I hate to criticize journalists because, oh, go ahead. you know, <laughs> well, no, because I feel like the mainstream media is good to me. I get quoted a lot. My op-eds run in many prestigious newspapers, so I don't want to bite the hand that feeds me. But nevertheless, you know, this is still continuing even now. And the other thing has to do with the spectrum of the mainstream media, because, yes, I acknowledge there is a tremendous amount of outstanding reporting in the Wall Street Journal. But it's also true that on the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal, disinformation about scientific facts has been perpetuated for more than 20 years. And this is a tricky space because, of course, the opinion page, the editorial page, is the place where it's appropriate to express opinions. But when these editorials make factual claims that are untrue, then that does a lot of damage. And Fortune, Forbes, the Wall Street Journal, these have been major places in which what we could call, um, I don't know what the right word is, I don't want to be pejorative, but let me just put it this way. If I'm on an airplane and I get offered a free upgrade, I have this existential dilemma because I'd like to sit in a more comfortable seat, but I know there's a good chance that I'm going to sit next to a climate change denier. <laughs> and why is that? <laughs> because it's a businessman. So, what, so what, do you, what do you do exactly? I, I take the seat. No, I take the seat <laughs> and argue. No, and, and no, I go into educational mode. I don't argue, but it's I It's a teachable moment. It's a teachable <laughs> moment. But no, but if one of these people says, well, why is it that you think I'll say that? And I have to tell you, nine times out of ten, they will say, well, there was this editorial in the Wall Street Journal, or I read a very interesting article in Forbes. Mm -hmm. And then one more piece, and then I'll pass. Or they say, well, you know, in the last... Um, primary, Ted Cruz pointed out that global warming had stopped. Mm. And so this is the other piece that we haven't talked about. The way in which Republican leadership have picked up these arguments and sometimes stray out of this right-wing echo chamber. So, so Jane, mm -hmm. let me ask mm -hmm. you this question. As, as a working journalist mm -hmm. here, in this world in which you're now operating, and it's, it's, a, it's a social media world. It's a world where there are weaponized information networks. That's what we're talking about here in many ways, where there is a super quick, super skeptical, super attack prone public. How do you write your stories? Do you write them differently? Do you think of, do you have to come at your subject matter differently than you did 15 years ago? So I keep a big thing of Tums, like right <laughs> by my desk. It is, it is very stressful, um, for sure, these days, because it, it's unpleasant and stressful a lot of the time. You know you're going to be attacked as soon as you put anything up online. It just, it's almost So knowing immediate. that you're going to so be attacked, can you, in, in the way you approach a story, write a story, mm -hmm. quote a source, um, reference facts, do you do that differently, or is there a more convincing way that you feel that you need to do it because you know you're going to be so quickly. I mean, I, I think, you know, you just want to make sure you're right. And I, I, I mean, I share a lot of Naomi's frustration with a lot of the press coverage, even though I'm in a part of the press corps and have been for a very long time. But part of the reason I do what they people call investigative reporting is because I think you, ha you have a responsibility to not just be a stenographer, but actually figure out, okay, so what is true here? And dig down and, and, and not, I, and I do believe in talking to all sides, and I think it's incredibly helpful to be able to speak to people in the Trump administration as well as other people. But then I want to put, if they're lying to me, I'm going to hang them out and put it in context and show that it's a lie. Um, and then the big, the reason for the Toms is it's really hard to get them on the phone again next week because you've just hung them out. But I, but it's 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 our responsibility. So I, I, I you know we, it's the job is the one of the hardest things right now is how fast it's moving. Mm -hmm. um, it's just you know so competitive and and I hate that people can see how many clicks a story gets mm -hmm. because all of the incentive then is to put something hypey in where to you're going to change the way you're well i mean i can tell you the the greatest beneficiary as far as i can tell from the click culture is donald trump because if you want to get people to read your story put his name in the headline 
Mm. And it's like that, you know, and, and, and so it flies. I mean, Yochai, I, so I have had, uh, certainly I've had multiple conversations <laughs> with people in the, the ratings-driven world, and they flat out say, as Les, the f you know, now fallen Les Moonves said famously during the campaign, Trump may be whatever you think he is for the country, but he's great for ratings. And this is why we see all these panels and this constant debate and so little grasp of policy. In your research, as you look at this kind of strange, noisy, post-fact world, is there any place where substance is being rewarded? <laughs> um, Harvard. Uh, Harvard. <laughs> Sorry. Harvard, Harvard. <laughs> the, New Yorker, uh, the New Yorker, there you go. George Washington University. George Washington, I'll jump right. on. Princeton, yeah. yeah. The New Yorker. Um, no, I think this is in fact, th th this is a critical um, uh, challenge, but I, I, um, um, I think it's a mode of failure more often than not and that organizations that build themselves around being able to have that credibility need to understand the costs of running after that and how that uh, ultimately, if you can't distinguish yourself from clickbait because you're constantly slapping clickbaity headlines over serious reporting, at the end of the day you're just reinforcing the idea that there's no difference. So it requires a lot of discipline in the space of uh, some very skewed incentives. Can I um, just say something? I, you know, uh, I don't think substance is adequately rewarded. Of course, all of us probably. You have written that. about media degradation. Okay, yeah, so okay. this is one <laughs> of the this is one yeah. of the one of the casualties. Yeah, but I do think I do think it is part of the responsibility of the established media to master these new contexts, online contexts, social media, to the extent that they can and to use strategies that get their uh, work out there. Uh, we can't just uh, sort of sit back and bemoan the fact that the world has changed. The world has changed. And, if, and you have to adapt to it to the extent that you can without presumably losing your soul. One last one, and then we <laughs> could come to the audience for questions, and I apologize for being, uh, I'm, I've gotten absorbed in this. It's just kind of what happens. Uh, one of the areas that we wanted to look at, and, and I said would be one of the themes, is this notion of appreciating the outside influence that has been brought to bear, the Russians and the Chinese and whoever, and from whatever basement this may be coming. <laughs> In your millions of stories, how do you quantify this influence? Uh, so. Specifically looking at Russians, uh, we use, uh, we primarily look at it in the context of specific case studies where we look at stories that were very important and we try to have a very clear timeline of when they showed up on 4chan, on Reddit, on this blog, on that site, etc. and attribute whether or not it's, it's Russians uh, based partly on what's available publicly partly on uh, what bots have played out in other Russia-related campaigns. Um, and they're there. Right? They're there as background signal or in, in many of these uh, uh, places, whether it's the Seth Rich conspiracy, whether it's the Clinton pedophilia. They're there. They jump. They, they jump. Sometimes they're very early on. Actually, we, we have a chapter where we say, here, here we found something that probably did come from Russia around the Podesta uh, emails. But again, the transition point, it's low level, and the transition point is Alex Jones publishes it, Drudge 20 minutes later, links to it, and within three hours it's on Hannity. And that's when it moves from being potential to actual. So even when we see them, and we see them, the kick happens when they're intentionally adopted, not because they thought it was true and it was a mistake. Eric Prince didn't believe that Hillary Clinton flew to Pedophilia Island six times when he said it on Breitbart Exit. Okay, but they're looking. And so, and so even when we do see the Russians as a source in the rare cases that we do, I think attributing ultimate responsibility to them is take, letting off the hook those who matter. And the overwhelming majority of cases, they don't need them at all. They produce them in-house, in, inside the right wing.
go for it. And I just ask you to introduce yourself and um, fire away. Hello, I'm Tyler Kuzma. I'm a student here at George Washington University. So by certain metrics, the far right ecosystem is very successful. Um, is there anything that the mainstream ecosystem can learn and improve upon based off what the far right ecosystem does? I'm happy to take that on. Um, um, uh, I would strongly resist it. I think what makes the right wing media ecosystem succeed is precisely what would utterly destroy American democracy if it were adopted by everyone. Mm -hmm. It is unilat it is persistent serving of outrage producing hate-filled versions of identity confirming uh, biased narrative that is utterly unconstrained by truth. And that's what's so attractive. It's like, uh, is there a something to learn from big sugar or tobacco about how to get people to eat uh, uh, whole grain? No. Uh, <laughs> and it's sugar, and, and it, it's, it's addictive, it's great, it's fantastic, and it'll kill you. <laughs> uh, so no, I would resist it. Thank you. Um, I, I'm wondering if Nancy McLean, I can, I can ask you to, to because you, you, you write, um, you have a, a paper here, you know, since we are greatly outnumbered, <laughs> right? And you, you, one of the things that, that you argue is that um, the Koch brothers, for example, and their perspective has to be stealth because it is so, so unpopular. Um, but does that underestimate uh, their allies and colleagues and fellow travelers in other parts of this ecosystem um, and understate the impact that they can have and that they have? Uh, well, I think the Koch brothers are very significant, not just them, but this large network of donors that Jane and others has have written about. Um, there's over 150 donors at this point, I think, coming to the, the Koch uh, summits. Um, there's a huge infrastructure of organizations that they're funding, you know, dozens of national, state, and international. Uh, so maybe maybe a way for me to, I don't know, ask, ask a question, uh, to set up a question is to um, uh, ask you all what you, how significant you think the climate questions are in this and the deep investment of folks in the fossil fuel uh, um, industry in skewing the public debate. And I'll just give you one example of why I think that that is so significant. We spoke earlier today of various uh, transnational market fundamentalist efforts. Uh, one of those projects is called the Atlas Network. It now has over 450 affiliates working in 96 countries, very much on the model of the ones that we see here and, and Jane and, and uh, Naomi and I and others have written about. Um, and I know someone from Greenpeace who went to a transnational uh, meeting of Greenpeace, folks from five continents, threw up a pop session and said, want to see what the Coke network is doing in your country. 200 people show up from five continents. All he does is that you can find this on the web. You go to the Atlas network and you get a a global map and you can get the affiliates in your on your continent and in your country he just said to everybody pull out your laptops look at your country report back in 10 minutes he said the room exploded because from around the world from five continents people said oh my god that's the organizations we're fighting. Oh my God, those are the academics who work for them and who go out into the press for them. And he just said it was just this extraordinary epiphany as people just did this real-time experiment and realized that these were the key organizations in their country pushing for climate science denial. And so, you know, given that so many people on this panel are dealing with that and that that's such a part of this, this ecosystem, if we had to sort of weigh the significance of that in all of this, this? Like, do, do, I don't know, does any of you have some insight into how, how important a driver the kind of sunk costs of the fossil fuel industry are and the amount of anticipated profit they'd be walking away from if we kept the fuels in the ground at this point? Well, I think it's obviously huge. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, the evidence for that plays out on a lot of levels, but you can think about a couple of things. One is if you look at what the Trump administration has actually achieved in the last two years, as opposed to a lot of the bombast and rhetoric and distressing talk, 
they were most organized from day one on the issue of environmental regulation. In fact, they were very disorganized on a lot of other things, but they were conspicuously organized about that. Scott Pruitt was put in place immediately, immediately announced the repeal of the Clean Power Plan, immediately started talking about bringing back coal. I mean, a whole set of things about which they were very organized. Also, this attempt to um, deny the use of scientific information under the guise of transparency. So, and, and of all, and the other thing, when, when Trump was first elected and he asked Rex Tillerson to be his Secretary of State, right. I can't tell you how many people said, well, isn't that good? He's a grown up, you know, <laughs> he's a reasonable man. And I said, no, stop and ask yourself this question. Of all the people in the world that he could have asked to be Secretary of State, why this man, this man who's never been in government, you know, never had, you know, wasn't a military officer, right? But we very quickly found out what was Tillerson's agenda to repeal the Russian sanctions that had been put in place, which were the only obstacle to the Russians developing the Arctic oil and gas reserves. So there's no question that these things are very closely linked. And then I'll just give one other piece of evidence. Um, one of the things the tobacco industry tried to do back in the 80s and 90s was to create a coalition of other industries, what they called third party allies. And one of my favorite stories was at a point which they reached out to the alcohol industry because they wanted to say, you know, alcohol, smoking, sugar, we're all in it together. We should band together. We should form a coalition to fight back against the nanny state. And the alcohol industry said, you must be kidding. Our product is good. Your product is <laughs> lousy. <laughs> you know? People like wine and beer and cocktails. And so the tobacco industry was never able to build the kind of coalition that it really wanted. But I think the Koch brothers have come much further along that path than the tobacco industry did. Okay, can I just <coughs> sure. respond here too? I think, I think it's, there's no doubt that uh, the fossil fuel industry and climate denial are very central to this. We should ask ourselves, ourselves a question here about the way in which their influence is working. Mm -hmm. So is it working through persuasion of the you know, large mass of the population about th uh, 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 their positions? Are they converting people to their positions? That's one possibility. And then those that public, now disbelieving uh, climate change, then leads their political leaders to shift. Or alternatively, is the influence primarily on elites, on political leaders and other influential people, whose signals then um, influence their followers. So they, so I, I think there's, there's a lot of research in political science that most people don't follow the details about policy. Right. They tend to take their cues from, from leaders they trust. So as these interests have, begin, have been able to, to shift, for example, opinion in the Republican Party, <coughs> Republican Party used to support a lot of um, Republican presidents. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Environmental Protection Act originally was signed by Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon. right? And, and George H.W. Bush. was the famous commercial of Newt Gingrich and Nancy Pelosi sitting side by side. Right. Yeah, so, um, so I think it's really worked through elite influence and then the, 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 uh, 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 the mass shifting in their direction. Can I just but say one other thing? It's not just, uh, it is elite influence, but what's influencing it is money. Yeah. Let's just yeah. get down to brass tacks here right. and, and face it. The Kochs fund primary challengers against Republican candidates who don't toe the line mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. their, on, in their climate position. They've, been the, they've put hundreds of millions of dollars into climate denial over the years. And it's a, a small down payment on the profits they get by fighting this, basically. The transition team for Trump was loaded with people who have worked for various parts of what people call the Coctopus, either Coke Industries di directly or their political operation. And those, the, the transition team picked people in the areas that matter to them, such as environmental regulation, that are pushing their interests. It's, it's it's ca a classic capture by private industry. 
But if I could just add one other quick thing, though. But it is both end. It's not just about the elites, because we also know not so much the Koch brothers, but other fossil fuel groups have also run campaigns in local newspapers, local radio. And I have to say, when you were talking about the gatekeeping function, I mean, I think you're right. I do think that is important, and it definitely played a role. But it was by no means without leaks, because right. Um, one of the campaigns that I documented was one around the time of the UN Framework Convention that was explicitly designed to undermine public support. And this is what the documents say. And they did it by reaching out to the editors of local newspapers, persuading mm -hmm. them to run articles saying, you know, we don't really know, et cetera, et cetera, and also local radio, a kind of saturation of the airwaves um, in small towns and small cities around the country. So I don't think we should underestimate the, the kind of both end aspect mm -hmm. of this, influence the elites, the Republican Party leadership, but also you know, get out there talking to the rank and file as well so that they can meet in the middle and be strong. Professor Livingston, a question. I'm Steve Livingston, George Washington University. I don't want everyone to leave here tonight thoroughly depressed because we've done an amazing <laughs> job at diagnosing the problem, but what's the solution? A lot of the focus, a lot of the attention is on fact checking, but it seems to me that there's a thirst for disinformation in Yokai said about 20 to a percent to a third of the population, they're not in. They think their facts are are completely legitimate and square. What kind of solutions can we identify and offer for addressing that sort of disinformation? One of our colleagues here, Ethan Porter, is well known for his research on the so-called backfire effect. Now, in all fairness, Ethan thinks it's overstated. But that's the claim that in the, in the effort of actually correcting misunderstandings, you deepen the commitment to that misunderstanding in the very act of trying to correct it. So how do you resolve these kinds of questions? Well, just... We're looking uh, for a few brave answers here. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, sometimes lies come back to haunt people. Look at what's happening in Britain with Brexit. Brexit was sold on the basis of falsehoods. And now the Conservative Party has to confront the fact that they can't deliver the Brexit they promised. So I think one basis for hope is that uh, there's, there's not necessarily impunity here. And, and what about, yeah. and I'd like to ask you this, to, to play on this question, okay, because you've looked at these millions of stories. And I, I started by asking you 2016 versus 2018. So people can now see, as this, this drama is playing out, about what did Trump know and where was Trump in this payoff to these women. Okay, we've got a series of statements his, that he's made, now countered by statements that others. Someone's gone to jail over this. There are some, isn't it possible then that experience over time, and what people see that this, that the, in, a, in a way that plays out, makes this a more complicated ecosystem than what, we were, than what you were snapshotting and seeing in, in 16. So, so um, I, I don't want to lose Steve. I, I will well, answer, but I want to go back also to Steve, I, which is more on the solutions thing. But, well, I, but, just, but I guess I see that as, I, what I'm saying is, isn't that a solution? That, well, that, one, that people will see things over time that render alternative facts, clearly alternative facts. So to the extent that you buy the interpretation of 2018, particularly the marginal seats that Democrats won as being about suburban Republican women uh, changing, um, uh, or, or, or some combination of that plus outrage at Trump, then you're already seeing the beginning of that working out and the, and the truth coming home to roost. Um, but but um, in some sense, that to me is more about hope that things will work out and let me sort of frame, uh, answer the solutions, the active, how do we design things. Um, and I would say uh, uh, probably not focus, two, di to, to, two completely different things. One, not focus exclusively on communications. Understand that the brittleness of a democratic system doesn't necessarily come from its communications, but from some interaction between its communications and its institutional framework. The reason the Leave campaign was able to win was not because there was misinformation and disinformation, though there were, but because they had set up an extremely unusual political mm. process mm. in Britain, the plebiscite, with an up or down uh, that actually took a major issue 
and removed all of the uh, all of the safety features and said, "Let's flip a coin," and they lost. And what we're seeing in the U.S. is a systematic, years-long campaign to allow a small, mobilized minority to control the political system. And it's the party primaries, and it's the voter suppression, and it's the gerrymandering. Um, uh, some of it quite foundational. When you look at the Senate, the intention is for minorities to have. So all of that says, what we will need is a series of political victories that will make this strategy a losing strategy. Yeah. But rather than hoping that the truth will come home to roost, I would say a heavy immediate focus on fixing those aspects of the, polit of the electoral system that allow a small, highly mobilized minority of 20 to 35 percent to end up electing a president uh, is the most so, so give us an example of what one of the small fixes would be. What kind of fixes are you talking about? Um, um, uh, there's a not, none of these are small. These are big efforts. The, these are big pushes to, electro, to electoral change. I think HR1 that the Democrats are planning to roll out is a major part <coughs> of the story. Um, it's a pushback against gerrymandering. Uh, it's a major uh, effort to get uh, universal voter registration and significant turnout. So, so focusing, here's the broad way in which what I'm saying is not irrelevant to this conversation. I worry that focusing heavily on the disinformation rather than the, the political institutions that the disinformation intersects with will push us towards solutions to a more marginal problem than the central problem. And we need to understand that critical here is the electoral institutional framework and the role of money in politics and political advertising, if we are talking about media, rather than focusing so heavily on fixing the disinformation problem for this cult-like large minority. And, and I agree with that, even though it might seem surprising since I focus so much on disinformation. But one of the things that's been important to me in this, and, and your comment about this being a minority, I think is really important. We know that about 25% of the American people, even today, still do not think that smoking causes cancer. So no amount of information is going That's to right. change that. I call those people the refractories. You're just not going to melt their opposition. Sure. But it doesn't really matter, because from a political standpoint, you don't need 100% unanimity. Right. You mm -hmm. need organized, right. bare majorities. And I think there are many ways that that can be achieved. And in the case of climate change, we have good evidence of two things. One is that people do not like to be conned. No yeah. one wants to be a sucker. And if you can show people the evidence that this is a con, that change that makes a big effect. That's Not what focus groups have shown. Uh, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of evidence yeah. on this. Yeah, but people don't like to admit they've been. Right, conned. right. So you have <laughs> to. You can't back them into a corner. <laughs> but, <that> but <laughs> the point is that if you give them that the information about the con, mm -hmm. it's quite different mm -hmm. than simply mm -hmm. giving them more scientific facts. And then the and just the other part of it, um, except now I've just for oh about solutions, right? Uh, climate change is a really bad news story. Nobody likes bad news. Not even liberals. Well, some liberals do, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so, um, but if you can say to people, look, there are solutions, and these are solutions that will not necessarily undermine your personal liberty. Clean Air Act amendments, missions trading, that was a great example. Business community responded, we got it done. Here we are, nobody even talks about acid rain anymore. So I do think one thing that, in the rhetoric of the space I am in, I don't actually agree with the rhetoric about, oh my God, this is such a difficult problem. It's an existential crisis of historic proportions. We've never dealt like with anything like this before. I actually think that's not helpful. I think it's more helpful to say, this is big. It's not trivial. We're not going to fix it overnight. And there's going to be quite a bit of damage because we've waited so long. But the solutions exist, the technologies exist, we can begin to think about how to implement them. And, and, it's and not impossible. Well, and you could frame that around American competitiveness and advantage, but that's what Barack Obama did. He built it on the three-legged stool of economic, environmental, and national security, and it didn't, it didn't stick. And well, there are some other well, reasons I there think are many, stick, There are many reasons. But, yeah. I mean, we could go late yeah. into the night on right. this one, and, and, and surely will, but I'd like to come back to some other questions. And uh, and so let everybody get... Hi, I'm Karen Kornblue, so I'm at the German Marshall Fund and running the technology policy <laughs> program there. And I just wanted to pick up on both what you said and what you said about it not being disinformation. I think when we talk about disinformation, often we're focused on the content of the particular article, is it true or false, as opposed to, I think, what you, what Naomi and Jane and um, Nancy write about, which is more in the nature of fraud. 
I think, which is hi hiding the supply chain of the content. So when well, it's good a, journalism, yeah. it's, you know, when you pick up the New York Times, there's a lot of what we in tech call metadata. The opinion section is separated from what claims mm -hmm. to be fact. The facts, can, you can sue for libel. There's a masthead that says who the, who the editor is and who the publisher is. There's a byline, et cetera, et cetera. You lose all of that supply chain information online. So there's, it's very hard for the reader to, uh, you know, and then you try to fact check so after right. the fact. But the Breitbart article looks the same as the New York Times article. And the supply chain of the fraud is taken out too. So the scientific, so-called scientific evidence. So I think, I, when, I, when I think of disinformation, I think that, we ha that now that all of this is coming to us through social media, there's a way in which social media that was supposed to bring all this transparency has instead obfuscated. That there's this incredible opacity because of the algorithm, because of the bots. And, and because all this metadata is stripped out. So I'd like to redefine disinformation and fake news, find a new word, yeah, this, this is very and important. talk about yeah. fraud right. and consumer and fraud. And then those of us who are interested in the truth, how do we introduce that kind of supply chain information? Because now even the, the Wall Street Journal editorial and news story look the same online. Yeah. So we a, have to yeah. rethink that. It's a hugely important question. I'm glad you raised it. Because there's one really important piece of factual information in this story. The tobacco industry faced quite a number of uh, civil suits against them up until 1979, and they won every single one of them. But then they started losing. And what made the difference? It was the exposure of right. the Brown and Williamson documents that showed that they had been involved in an organized campaign to a fraud. And when that came out, it changed how juries viewed the evidence. It was no longer a question of an individual deciding to vote, to, sorry, to smoke or vote, but to smoke, but it was about an individual being defrauded. Um, I do like, I really like the notion of fraud. Yeah, and I I, that, I, that, because yeah. you know, everybody's struggled with yeah. it's fake news, it's false news, yeah. it's deliberate misinformation, it's a <laughs> lie. But, 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 but that, that, that is, that I is also, a. I, li I, was just, I also like the idea of exposing the supply the chain, supply as chain. she said. Yes. So that yes. if you run something that's a quote from a paper from the Cato Institute, why don't you mention who's on the board of directors and where the money came from yes. for it? Yes. I mean, I, 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 yes. I think, and it also helps answer yes. the free speech question yes. because Judge Kessler, in her really important 100 plus page decision, the most memorable line was the First Amendment does not protect fraud. Yes, but but and yet and yet I worry <laughs> oh, that come on, fraud. we just solved it. <laughs> I, I, no, but um, <laughs> so we in our definition of disinformation absolutely include uh, um, um, not just false facts, but but misleading framing efforts to to mm -hmm. uh, mislead people. And but but fraud and perhaps this is one of the rare occasions where the fact that I'm a law professor will actually show. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> fraud has a very narrowing feature. Mm -hmm. So if Breitbart spends four years producing a steady flow of stories about immigration as being scary and terrible and about brown people, particularly Muslims and terrorists coming across, not only everywhere, but even the southern border thing. That's not fraud, but it is a disinformation campaign in the sense that it misleads people into thinking about what's critically important and thinking about in particular terms. And I worry about the fraud framing uh, narrowing too much, even more than just the false facts. Uh, and I'd be uh, and I and I'd be resistant to that. On Can the we, other hand, we call it fraudulent. <laughs> on the other well, hand, some of it say, anyway. It might not be all of it. Yeah, I mean, fraudulent. There, 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 uh, I just I I, yeah. I, I, I do I don't want to miss this basic point about transparency yeah. all the way down. Who's paying? How they're paying? Everything using the data and our ability to collect data and then present it, so that every piece comes with a health label that tells you here are the toxins in here. That's critically important, and I and 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 I think that's really. I was just going to say w one other th method that uh, that uh, I'm not in the solutions business. I'm in the reporting business. <laughs> but one thing that's <laughs> interested me in watching what what's had an effect also are these uh, advertiser boycotts, mm -hmm. which we've seen, and I, it's been surprisingly effective to me. You didn't. I didn't used to think they were, but I think actually social media makes them mm -hmm. more effective because the word is out so fast. And you can see people 
um, shunning certain kinds of news stories. And one could imagine more of that. Mm -hmm. you could, one yes. could imagine more of that. David Ensor. Hello, oh, um, I'm David Ensor from the George Washington University Media School here, uh, and a uh, like Frank, a former journalist. Um, so I can't resist such a strong panel asking you again for solutions in the area of the mainstream media where I used to work. Um, it seems to me that we started to have problems well before digital and well before social media. Uh, I can remember a time when I started to be asked by editors and uh, producers to go on television and talk about something that had been reported somewhere else just because it was out there. Hmm. It's out there. We have to have a, you say whatever you want. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. just going to knock it down. Go ahead, knock it down, but get on the air and do so. Yes. That to me, and that was well before digital came along, was the beginning of the problem. How do we, how do we get to, in, in, a, in a country where most of the media have a profit motive, and I'm proud of that. I, I, I've lived off of that for many years, and there's some wonderful journalism done in this country. I, I worry that we, we don't have enough media who don't run on the profit motive. If it bleeds, it leads is not always the right way to decide uh, what should be at the top of the broadcast, and yet it often is, certainly in local television. Uh, Trump, as someone on the panel said, is great for the ratings. He's not just great for the ratings on Fox. He's great for the ratings on MSNBC and CNN. Well, your example and, is CBS. And they're making more money than they've ever made before right now and enjoying it very much, thank you very much. And people who don't like Trump are watching obsessively because Trump is an obsession for <laughs> even people who don't like him. Money's being made. So how do we work on our mainstream media and make it somehow part of the solution and not part of the problem? Jane? Jane. <laughs> and Paul. Well, yeah, I mean, when I was at the Wall Street Journal, we used to have a category of story called DBI, which meant dull but important. <laughs> and, um, and we would run them um, because we thought they were important. And I think not every story has to get maximum clicks, and there needs to be respect for some that just happen to be very important, hopefully not too dull. But a lot of pressure's on us also to, um, you know, it's our job to make it interesting, even if it's not about Trump, and to find ways to tell stories that mm -hmm. capture people's imagination and to make people care. And you can get pretty lazy and not try hard enough sometimes. And so, um, you know, it's on us to some extent well, to do the job really well. Well, what do you think of that? I, I, I think Jane has the right answer. Uh, People have to be creative in telling stories, and uh, 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 we, we we had a discussion earlier today, um, uh, which uh, had to do with uh, the different attitudes of uh, the right and the left. This was in reference to Germany in the 1920s, and uh, at that time, I I was not aware of this. Uh, the um, uh, the, the more liberal left media uh, were reluctant to use visual images and um, uh, also uh, uh, reluctant to appeal to the emotions, whereas the right used visual images and uh, appealed to the emotions. Now, the emotions they appealed to were hatred and so forth, but there, there was nothing wrong with the, or there should not have been anything wrong, mm -hmm with the liberal and left media using visual images and appealing to other emotions. And there are, there's a reasonable place for an appeal to emotion. Um, and I think actually we're all appealing to emotions, you know, as we talk about, about uh, integri integrity <laughs> and science. Uh, no, uh, 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 even, even talking about the integrity of the news, we're, we're appealing to emotion. We, we, we can, um, uh, we can, I mean, the mainstream media can creatively uh, uh, appeal to emotions that support um, uh, justice and, and so I'm, you know, that's, that, but that, that's. Also, <laughs> but, but in some ways you are contradicting what Yochai said earlier because, so you're saying there are some elements of how yeah. the right wing operates that maybe we could learn from. And, I, and the way I think about it is what you said about not being lazy. So I give a lot of public talks where I get asked about the solutions to climate change, most of which are technological. And 
that's hard sometimes to make it interesting. So one of the things I sometimes do is say, I tell my audience, I'm going to talk about something really sexy now. It's grid integration. <laughs> 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 well, that's, I have to say, in, in the DBI category at the Wall Street Journal, there was one famous story where it's, the lead was, this is a story about the third largest paper company in America. And then the next sentence said, oh, come on, read it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> just, uh, just perhaps to correct uh, the earlier impression. Uh, and I'd be curious to hear, because I know you've been. Uh, so, so BuzzFeed. Mm -hmm. uh, which has become a really important source of data journalism on some of the issues that we're talking about. Uh, Upworthy. Uh, they're, 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 it's not as though there are no right. left-leaning mm -hmm. organizations, but critically, they continue to be integrated within the same ecosystem, so there are boundaries mm -hmm. on the ability. And what I was pushing back on was not try to find ways of getting people's attention. What I was pushing back on was replicate the heart of what made it work. Mm -hmm. Because I don't see the clickbaity um, 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 titles as what's the heart. The heart is the project of confirming identity and stoking outrage. And that I reject. But not the, not the marketing techniques necessarily. The problem is, and we document this in the book, is that sometimes when you do that, you have a really, you spent two weeks reading Clinton emails. Mm. Your conclusion is, nah. It's not right. there. <laughs> what are you going to do? Are now you going to say, nah? <laughs> yeah. No, you're going to say, donors got access to Clinton in State Department. Paragraph 17. Doesn't make me feel banned rights, uh, um, uh, Aberdeen rights. Um, doesn't make me feel comfortable to give them access. Band rights, okay, so don't. Facts are there. So on that note, uh, <laughs> <laughs> look, I, I'm just, I, I just was, sp was speaking with Marty Barron, the executive editor of the, Washington, of the Washington Post, and they've just announced that they now have 1.5 million digital-only subscribers. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the New York Times has uh, boasts of something like 2.9 million digital yeah. digital-only subscribers. There is. Um, something happening here. There, there is a new business model. People will pay for this. There will be, among some, a recognition and flight to quality, I believe. And there is some terrific journalism that takes advantage of these new technologies. And actually, to the, I would cite one phenomenal piece that was just uh, published the other day in the Washington Post on climate change. It was Chris Mooney's piece on the 95% disappearance of thick Arctic ice. Mm. So first of all, the article was terrific, but it had embedded in it a video okay, that essentially was a time lapse yeah. from 1960-something to the present day. And you see the ice disappearing. So you can read the piece, but you can experience that. Some of that technology, some of that mm -hmm. kind of information mm -hmm. that is going to be available to people increasingly, yeah. yes, it will fight with the deep fakes and other kinds of things, is what must give us some sense of hope. Mm -hmm. And that what, what m will give these traditional news organizations that has, have, in some cases, hundreds of years of legacy and, and, and brand identity and credibility as a result, the leverage to push back against some of this, that 25, 20, 25 percent, they're not going to be moved. They, they still think Richard Nixon had nothing to do with Watergate. I mean, there <laughs> will be that core group of people. The question and the drama is, how does that play out? How does the leverage play out? How does the popular vote square off against the electoral map as to where we are going to go? And that's the suspense, and that's what we don't know, and that's why you need to keep doing everything you're doing, <laughs> and then some. I would like to thank uh, Steve Livingston for helping to make this possible, and the Social Science Research Council for being here, and wish you the very best in the days ahead, and our amazing, wonderful, brilliant panelists thank for you. participating. Thank you. thank you all very much. Have a lovely, lovely evening, everybody. Be safe and be well. <laughs>